Hello, and welcome to today's Jewish Policy Center webinar. I am Shoshana Bryan, Senior Director of the JPC and your host. There are a lot of you out there today, and I think I know why. It's a combination of worry about the increasing pressure the Biden administration is putting on Israel, although its ploy at the UN was foiled by China and Russia vetoing our resolution. But that in combination with our terrific guest, Richard Goldberg. Now, I don't know if Rich is going to make us feel better, but I know we're going to learn a lot. So today we go with the short JPC commercial. We were founded in 1985 to provide perspectives and analysis of foreign and domestic policy by scholars, academics, and commentators. You can find us on our website, jewishpolicycenter.org. There, you can sign up for our Insight articles and our magazine, In Focus Quarterly. The winter issue of In Focus Quarterly is up right now. It is devoted to the awakening in the American Jewish community after October 7th. The spring issue will be up shortly, and that will look at Israel's ongoing battle for the security of its people. That's jewishpolicycenter.org. The JPC supports a strong American defense capability, U.S.-Israel security cooperation, and missile defense. Right now, however, our most important job is to support the legitimacy and security of the government of Israel against anyone who would deny them. And now more than ever, we support the government and the IDF in their defense of the people and in bringing the perpetrators of the massacres, rapes, hostage taking and rocket barrages to justice and making Hamas and its fellow travelers release the hostages. Our guest today, Richard Goldberg, is a senior advisor to the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He previously served as, long title, coming here, Director for Countering Iranian Weapons of Mass Destruction for the White House National Security Council. It's longer even than I could do. He was Chief of Staff for Illinois Governor Bruce Rauner and Deputy Chief of Staff and Foreign Policy Advisor to former U.S. Senator Mark Kirk of Illinois. On Capitol Hill, Rich was the Republican Staff Director for the Congressional Task Force Against Anti-Semitism. He spearheaded a major expansion of U.S.-Israel missile defense cooperation and drafted the toughest sanctions ever imposed on the Islamic Republic of Iran. In the governor's office, he authored the first ever state legislation to divest public pension funds from companies engaged in boycotts of Israel. On the National Security Council, he coordinated key elements of the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign against Iran. A point of honor for Rich, he was sanctioned by Iran in August of 2020. He also served as U.S. Navy Intelligence Reserve Intelligence Officer with the rank of Lieutenant Commander. In 2011, he deployed with a squadron to Afghanistan, where among other things, he served as the Jewish lay leader at Bagram Airfield. Rich, you wrote a great piece in Commentary Magazine in which you made five points, things you said that should not be allowed to happen in Gaza. First, God, you wrote, Gaza has no future with Hamas or other terrorist groups involved. Second, Israel cannot repeat the mistake of unilaterally abandoning security control of Gaza. Third, no country ever sponsoring or providing safe haven to Hamas can be allowed any role in Gaza whatsoever. Fourth, no political governing, excuse me, no political party or governing authority that pledges to destroy Israel promotes terrorism against Israel or pushes economic warfare against Israel can be part of a post Hamas Gaza. Fifth and finally, international organizations that promote anti-Semitism or incitement against Israel that are complicit in Hamas war crimes and that fail to submit their staff and contractors to US counterterrorism vetting cannot be trusted to help build a better future for Gaza. I am afraid, Rich, that all five of those are being undermined by the US government at this moment. Rich Goldberg, how much trouble are we in? Well, thanks everybody for joining us uh, and thanks for, for having me uh, on today. Uh, no shortage of things for us to talk about and I look forward to what I'm sure is many, many questions out there, but let's, let's tackle this first, Shoshana, as, as, as you opened up. Listen, I think uh, when I wrote that piece in commentary, this is back in early December, uh, I think when, when it first went online or was submitted at least for the January issue. 
And we had not gotten a fully formulated articulation from the Israeli government at that point as to what a post Hamas Gaza might look like, what the parameters would look like uh, for how Israel was even thinking about it because they were engaged in the war and people had been clamoring for what's the plan, what's the plan, people are still saying what's the plan, there is a plan. Um, but uh, Israel had a moment where it had no choice other than to engage in the war that they are in today with the objective being the elimination of Hamas. They couldn't take six months, a year to say, oh, how should we react to October 7th? This was not a war of their choosing. This was a war of necessity and survival in the broader context as well of the Iran ring of fire that surrounds them, knowing Hamas is just one element, maybe the, the least of dangerous elements. When you think about Hezbollah in the north with 10 times the lethality and force, the Houthis having grown in power and showing what they can do there in the Red Sea, even missiles uh, launched in southern Israel, militias in Iraq and Syria, capable of launching drones all the way down, apparently, to a lot from Syria, as we've seen during this conflict, and Iran's nuclear program itself advancing. So for them not to go in, not to engage, not to defeat Hamas, to stop short of the destruction and dismantlement of Hamas uh, from any point is already a surrender to that ring of fire and, and a guarantee of a really difficult generation to come for this security and survival of the state of Israel. Uh, that said, what, what will those parameters look like? The stated war objectives uh, from the Netanyahu unity uh, coalition, the, the, the war cabinet, have been clear in some respect. Uh, number one, Hamas must be removed from, from power. It's it's uh, control of Gaza destroyed, dismantled. Uh, uh, Gaza itself can never again become a, a platform for launching terror attacks against Israel, uh, being another major one. And then, of course, the securing the release of all hostages or returning uh, anyone who is not alive home uh, to their families for burial. And so they are all interlinked, obviously, but but that is a top line objective. How do you start putting some meat on the bones and say, okay, what are the what are the guardrails here to actually help you achieve those objectives long term? The dismantlement, the removal of Hamas and Gaza up front may be simpler in some ways than the long term guarantee of ha Hamas not returning, of a Hamas ally not returning, of Gaza. long-term measures to give you the best chance of fulfilling that here you know sort of like a, for your for your youngsters you know if you just give a sheet of paper to a five-year-old and say draw me something you're not going to love what it ends up being unless you really have a talented five-year-old which is possible i suppose but for for my four-year-olds at least um we like to have lines maybe some color by number you know some parameters and you get a beautiful uh a picture in the end and so that was sort of my view here is let's let's draw the lines and then we can decide what is left what what are what are the possible solutions okay so no hamas in gaza no uh hamas like parties being allowed into a political process uh, really dismantling their infrastructure removing their command and control putting them in a position where even though you'll have a long term need for special operations and surgical strikes to remove cells that continue to operate and pop up just as you do by the way in judea and samaria um, how can you ensure that at least they will not be able to interrupt some process of reconstruction, some process of what comes next there, and more importantly, will not use the political arms that they have to reassert themselves in the delivery of aid, in governance, civil society, potential elections in the future, etc. From an Israeli policy perspective, this seems pretty clear cut. Um, this is core to the to the war objective. It's core to the messaging you hear out of the Israeli government, whether it's Netanyahu, whether it's Ron Dermer, who you may have seen on on the, the Dan Senor Call Me Back podcast this week, um, or other members of the unity government. This seems to be clear. And the Rafa element of this is what's, uh, I think, right now, the disconnect in achieving that policy 
with where the Biden administration has been evolving. Now, where is Biden on this exactly, this question of, is Israel going to destroy Hamas? When will Israel destroy Hamas? What does it mean to destroy Hamas in Gaza? Uh, you heard Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, a few days ago when he spoke at the White House podium ahead of Secretary Blinken being dispatched to the region, the president's call with Prime Minister Netanyahu in which Prime Minister agreed to send a team to Washington uh, likely next week to discuss uh, alternative ideas the White House has. You heard Secretary Blinken uh, just about, uh, about 45 minutes ago. I saw he gave a tarmac uh, media availability on his way out of Israel um, using the same language, and that was United States President Biden supports Israel's objective in destroying Hamas in Gaza, in eliminating its forces, in removing its control. So supposedly we are aligned on this objective and that we're only having a disconnect here between Washington and Jerusalem on the tactics on how to achieve that objective, on the strategy potentially. Is that actually true? Or is that a ruse uh, to uh, find nice rhetorical ways to say we're actually with you while you turn the screws to prevent Israel from doing what the IDF believes it needs to do to fulfill that objective? That is an open question. It's an open question. I, I There are many who will leap to the conclusion that Biden is trying to stop the war quickly. He does not actually support Israel finishing the job in Rafah. 83% of Israelis say they support an expanded ground operation in Rafah. Uh, you've heard Ron Dermer say this week, there is no choice. We are going in. There's no way to actually remove Hamas in Gaza if you don't go into Rafah to remove Hamas in Rafah. Um, there are other points here that I would say are worth us considering. And the question to me is not if, but when, potentially. If there is to be some temporary ceasefire that is in Israel's interest to uh, get hostages out, get more hostages, if that's possible, even though I think everything else in the background going on makes that harder and harder to achieve, and we can talk about that, about how the administration speaks, today's resolution, all the things that are happening are encouraging Sinwar not to negotiate, are making him believe that Israel is being pressured to stop the war, so why should he give up uh, anything uh, ahead of uh, an Israeli capitulation to American pressure? But uh, Jake Sullivan pointed out that there is a lack of stability in northern Gaza. That is true. We have seen weeks now of concerns of cells popping back up, smuggling going from south to north. Uh, clearly, the disruption of humanitarian assistance and distribution networks by Hamas is an intentional aspect of its strategy to leverage a humanitarian crisis, or at least the notion of a humanitarian crisis, to link back up with UNRWA, uh, the make any alternative that's non-Hamas something that's unreliable, unsafe, uh, and use its people in civilian clothing to retake at least governance authority, civil uh, authority in parts of northern Gaza, where, of course, the Israelis have had a massive demobilization over the last couple of months since the beginning of the year to take pressure off of the economy, to return reserves uh, to, to their lives, and also to hedge against the potential for a redeployment and reactivation if there were to be a major war in the north with Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. That has allowed room, a vacuum, for Hamas to step in. Um, so is there a need for stabilization operations in northern Gaza? Yes, I think there's a strong argument for that. How that is done, how that's balanced with the need to continue the fight in Khan Yunus right now, make sure Khan Yunus falls, that Hamas's command and control there is destroyed. What is the right approach into, into Rafah? You've heard the administration, Jake Sullivan, say that they would support, and it's been leaked out, a plan for Israel, the United States, and Egypt to take control of the Rafah uh, border with Egypt, perhaps Israeli presence there, start really digging down and trying to prevent the smuggling, destroy all tunneling that might go down through the border areas. That, to me, is not a replacement for an, a ground operation into Rafah. But it also, to me, does sound like one of the first steps you would have anyways if you were planning a ground operation into Rafah as sort of the Alamo, the last stand for Hamas falling back. 
Why would you want more smuggling coming in? Why would you want any escape going out? Um, if you were to actually start closing down, if the IDF takes Khan Yunus and closes the border with Egypt, or at least has control of it, and starts squeezing in, at some point can take control of, of Rafa and has control of Khan Yunus to start moving into the tunnel infrastructure between those two cities where we suspect Yahya Sinwar, Mohammed Daif, the top two of Hamas in Gaza, many hostages may be located. That to me sounds like what the logical way you would proceed in an operation is anyways. There's another factor here. The Israelis appear to have penetrated some element of the counterintelligence internal security apparatus of Hamas in southern Gaza. You are seeing major, major, major targeted strikes, um, big high value targets being eliminated, uh, the uh, surprise raid on on uh, on the hospital, Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, I'm sure everybody is seeing, and the mass arrests and surrender of Hamas terrorists, high value officials who apparently just thought, hey, let's just go back into Shifa Hospital. I think all of us believed in the narrative that Israel has control of northern Gaza, including, including Gaza City. Apparently not. Uh, apparently... Even in Shifa Hospital, hundreds of Hamas operatives were able to return after IDF had already cleared the hospital and destroyed the tunnel infrastructure, we were told. And yet, they had intelligence on this. They found out what was happening. They waited uh, a surprise uh, attack on, on the hospital. And it's uh, now going to pay even more intelligence dividends as they're interrogating all these high-value uh, Hamas officials uh, that, that they've taken into custody, not just killed. And so you see all this happening. Does that mean they might find out more intelligence of where Sinwar is? If Sinwar, if we woke up with a headline on Sunday morning and found out that not just uh, uh, Haman had been killed back in the Purim story uh, at the end, but that Sinwar had just been killed as well, uh, what does that mean underneath Sinwar in, in the bureaucracy uh, of Hamas? What does that mean for the middle level of uh, folks who might consider crossing over, either a surrender, negotiation for their uh, exile from, from Gaza to somewhere else, uh, et cetera. What does it mean for the hostage deal and hostages? So all of these are factors in the background to just keep in the back of your mind. Objective is still Hamas removal, Hamas dismantlement, destruction, and control of Gaza. Israel's not going to sacrifice that objective. And if, in the end, the administration uh, really says, no, we're just not going to allow you to do something further, then we will be at that moment of decision for Israel where they may face a threat on the cutoff of military assistance, no longer an America that will veto resolutions at the Security Council, even though you'd have to have a, have a conversation of the value of the resolution put forward today, which was pretty much already pressuring Israel not to go into Rafa, just happened to say also release the hostages and by the way, the Houthis are bad, uh, and that provoked the Iranians to ask the Russians uh, and uh, Chinese to veto the resolution. But be that as it may, military assistance is still flowing to Israel. It's a lot. Um, Israel still has the United States vetoing resolutions that are anti-Israel. We may see one later today um, or, or early next week. So there is still value as you think about a potential war in the north and the need for American support there, uh, as you think about the Iranian nuclear advancements. Um, all of these are going to be factors in how Israel thinks about staging what comes next. Last piece I'll say on this piece is we're in Ramadan. There was a lot of signaling from Israel in the weeks leading up to Ramadan that Israel was afraid of escalation during Ramadan. Because Iran, they had intelligence that Iran and Hamas were planning a major escalation. Uh, they were counting on Rafah to begin, and then they would use bloodshed in Rafah to radicalize and activate people at uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and throughout Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and that this would open a new front uh, in, in the war. It hasn't happened yet. The Israelis are trying their best to avoid various escalations throughout Ramadan to, to try to uh, not allow any sort of pretext for this to happen. Not that, in my view, Iran or Hamas ever needs a pretext. Uh, they'll invent whichever one they want. They have plenty of strikes still going on that we're seeing, and there's operations still going on in Khan Yunus. There's also the practical matter of people are fasting. 
during Ramadan. They're out in the streets at night uh, as they're enjoying their meals um, uh, after after long days of fasting. This has potential humanitarian impact on evacuations, on operations uh, in Rafah. So all of these things are are in the IDF's mindset for the staging. Of course, they're at the negotiating table in Qatar right now, still discussing a potential six-week ceasefire for hostages. So I think it's too early to say the U.S. has completely abandoned this. I think it's clear that the White House has had a pivot politically to pressure Israel to change the entire face of the war, um, to halt all major operations, to convert to only special operations and surgical strikes, uh, to have some sort of ceasefire in place that they can move on to their big dreams of two-state solution and a ceasefire in Lebanon that's worthless, uh, and, uh, and and you know this bizarre negotiation still goes on with Saudi Arabia uh, for normalization, uh, all the things we can talk about and where those stand. But in the end, I feel very confident based on what I've heard in private and in public from the Israeli leadership, there is no break in this commitment, and they have solid political unity across the spectrum to go forward, including potentially a ground operation in Rafah at some point of their choosing when it makes sense in balancing all the other interests we just talked about to ensure you don't have Hamas long-term in Gaza. Have, you know, having Hamas, having four battalions in Rafah cleared out while Hamas regains control of Northern Gaza would be a Pyrrhic victory in Rafah. So let's, let's just keep in mind the full picture here not just the one political battle that is going on over when and how uh, for a Rafa operation will unfold. On the rest of the points there, um, for Israel not to make the same mistake it made in 2005 uh, with the disengagement uh, from Gaza. That has been clearly articulated by Prime Minister Netanyahu, and you've heard this for months, pairing both Israeli population and the international community for some form of long-term security presence by Israel in Gaza. This is shaping into various forms, a demilitarized area along the border uh, between Israel and Gaza, where it says today, one kilometer, two kilometers, whatever that's going to, five kilometers, whatever that's going to look like, sort of a no man's land to prevent uh, an October 7th type uh, event. Uh, I imagine you will see IDF control of key routes uh, inside uh, Gaza still for military patrols and convoys potentials. Uh, the border with Egypt, this is all part of the ongoing negotiation right now over the RAF operation and what the border control will look like, who will be in charge, how will, how will that be conducted, what's the long-term view of Israeli control uh, over that border to prevent the reemergence of deep tunnels and smuggling and, and just leaving this up to Egypt, which clearly had turned a blind eye for so many years uh, to to the smuggling. So uh, I think this is an ongoing conversation of what that looks like. It doesn't sound to me like the Americans are going to be pushing at this point for Israel to withdraw completely. Israel has said it doesn't want to occupy, which means responsibility of civilian control. Um, but this is also, by the way, where we are having tension right now and where we're having some challenges in northern Gaza. Because Israel, quite you know, obviously, um, and and not without sense, doesn't want to take over civilian occupation of Gaza. But at the same time, there is no day after yet. This is one of the reasons why there are distribution problems in northern Gaza. This is part of the reason why we have a need for stabilization operations in northern Gaza. It's why Hamas is gain, regaining some footholds there. And so um, this is this is key in in the in the larger conversation of 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 what's going on, what's going forward right now uh, that you're seeing play out in the media. Uh, okay, Palestinian Authority involvement, that third condition, I think it was um, third or fourth as far as political parties, entities that uh, sponsor terrorism against Israel, a for slay, uh, engage in economic warfare against Israel, the BDS movement. Um, that don't potentially recognize Israel as a Jewish state uh, or in some ways incite violence against Israel? Have you seen what Palestinian media has done since October 7th? Um, the, the Palestinian Authority president himself has a PhD in Holocaust denial. So what are we talking about here? Um, the idea that the Americans are pushing for Palestinian Authority control in Gaza 
And the Israelis have said that is absolutely outside the bounds of what they're willing to tolerate is a real contradiction in policy and is a real uh, point at which we have not gotten to that moment where that actually comes to a head, but we're getting there. And you've seen machinations of, oh, well, there could be a unity uh, situation where Fatah and Hamas come together and Fatah will lead this government and the technocrats from the PA will come into Gaza and they'll be the ones leading Gaza. But the PA actually is unified as a Palestinian people. Who promotes this idea? The Qataris, uh, state sponsor of Hamas for, for many, many, many years. Uh, what does that mean? That means A... Not only do you have the Palestinian Authority in charge of Gaza, you also have Hamas surviving the war and reintegrating itself into the political apparatus. So you're now you're violating two principles that I've laid out, and you're ensuring that you are going to have Gaza come back as a major terror threat to Israel long term. So that that's a garbage plan that that has to get thrown out the window. But there's been talk of a revitalized PA. They call it an RPA. That's the new term. If you go to Israel, you hear about this RPA, Revitalized Palestinian Authority. What that means, my God. Uh, if it doesn't mean complete overhaul of, of the Palestinian Authority to root out corruption, get rid of the pay for slave program entirely, get rid of incitement in their media, get rid of their textbooks, which foment anti-Semitism. You all hear about the UNRWA textbooks. You know what textbooks those are even in Gaza? Those are Palestinian Authority textbooks. OK, so let's let's understand who we're dealing with here. Um, if you don't have uh, a, an elimination of UNRWA in not just in Gaza, but in Judea and Samaria and transition of all those services over to the Palestinian Authority, which is integral to actually having an institution that is trying to better Palestinian life and society where they live, not foment uh, incitement for the future to commit another October 7th, which is what UNRWA is and is all about uh, intrinsically, um, you'll never have peace. We, we see poll after poll coming out from Judea and Samaria areas, the Palestinian Authority uh, territories, with overwhelming support still for October 7th, overwhelming opposition to Israel. The de-radicalization of the population is going to have to be a priority before anybody talks about an institution being able to make peace or to govern or to do anything that delivers anything in the best interest of our ally Israel's security. So ensuring that the Palestinian Authority is far, far away from this is very important. Now, some people have said, OK, what does that leave? Who's the technocrats in charge? Are there people in Gaza that can be rehabilitated, people who were maybe working for a Hamas ministry, but that's just in name only? They weren't really Hamas. The IDF, Shin Bet, others have been going through a lot of lists, as far as I understand. And they're looking at who people are, what their backgrounds are, what their affiliations are. Are there people who are capable of running a ministry of some kind, doing governance of some kind, who are not actually hardened Hamas individuals? They could be cleared to go into a government that is funded largely by the Gulf Arabs, along with the United States and other Europeans. Uh, you've seen the report that came out from JINSA and uh, Vandenberg Coalition, good friends of ours, um, uh, talking about an international trust that would be set up. Uh, I'm working right now, uh, along with my FTD colleagues and others, on a plan for post-UNRWA that could be implemented immediately. I think it would fit very well together uh, with that trust idea of who's sort of funding and, and uh, uh, providing the governance support, which will also include taking UNRWA out of Gaza and handing over those services either to the new government authority or on a short-term bridge basis to other agencies that are not pro-Hamas or at least integrated with Hamas. Um, this all obviously leads together into the last two pieces. I talked about the Qatari plan for Gaza is Hamas survival. We've seen that obviously in the Qatari uh, representation of Hamas in negotiations over the hostages. Every single uh, negotiation point they put forward is one for Hamas to survive the war in some way in exchange for hostages to be released. Uh, key point, Qatar should have nothing to do with the future of Gaza, period. Nor should the Turks, nor should any sponsor of Hamas. And yet, the Qataris are at the table in every meeting that the U.S. sponsors. The U.S. continues to roll out the red carpet for the Qataris as recently as a couple of weeks ago with a major summit in Washington, we laud them with praise as a major ally. We continue to uh, extend our lease on the base uh, that we have an air base in Qatar. We just did this for 10 years without even asking for anything in return, like, you know, cutting off support to Hamas. 
Um, we have now reportedly put them in a position to take responsibility for the port. You've heard about the pier that's being built in Gaza. Can't get any administration official to talk about this. Many have asked. But Israeli journalists have reported this out. It does appear to be true until somebody tells me it's completely false. Um, the Qataris are now taking over the port aspect of when the U.S. military will construct a pier, will deliver aid. On the other side of that pier will be the Qataris and their Hamas agents taking possession of the aid, fulfilling the security requirements for it, and taking on distribution. This is a guarantee of Hamas surviving the war. This has to be stopped immediately. It is actually one of the most near-term things that needs to be tackled. The idea that we're building a pier, putting Qatar in charge of it, along with Hamas, is completely crazy. Completely crazy. Why the Israelis are going along with this, I have no idea. They should not. Um, so, so this is one element here where I see the Qataris coming in to the picture. The Israelis may let them in because they're still at the table in Doha with the Mossad director doing hostage negotiations. And sadly, there are people in the Mossad at the highest levels and people in the Israeli government who have worked with the Qataris for years and believe all their lies and were sold on their schemes a long time ago and have not changed their view of the Qataris as potential helpers because they are partners with Hamas instead of viewing them as they are enemies of the United States and Israel and supporters of radical Islamist agendas. And finally, UNRWA. This is, this is a major point of contention here. We are seeing the United States actively work to save UNRWA. Politically, they know they can't fund UNRWA at this point. Democrats have fought tooth and nail in the bill that just passed the House of Representatives a few minutes before everybody hopped on to have a prohibition on aid to UNRWA, direct prohibition, a direct aid to UNRWA, only through March of 2025, not permanent. There's no prohibition on another agency laundering our money back to UNRWA. So if we take money away from UNRWA, but we give it instead to the World Food Program, the World Food Program takes their extra 50 million and gives it to UNRWA. We can't stop that from happening. It's not a condition of our aid to the World Food Program. And by the way, I understand that that's exactly what's happening as aid goes into Gaza through the World Food Program, they stop after the border, they hand it over to UNRWA and say, okay, it's yours now, in many cases. Now, World Food Program is still US-led, Cindy McCain. It has the opportunity to partner with Israel for alternative ways of distribution. They've tried that out. You've seen some of the press reports. There are UNRWA alternatives that we can't just say, we're not gonna use you because of what you've done or how you've spoken so far. I wish we could do that. But if we're going to actually dismantle UNRWA and get them out of the picture starting in Gaza, we're going to need some of these other actors like World Food Program, and we're going to have to direct it. We're going to have to say, this is it. This is the condition of our aid. Right now, Washington's not willing to do that. Uh, if UNRWA is partnering with Hamas to distribute aid into northern Gaza, which it sounds to me like is what is happening as part of the scheme to reassert control in northern Gaza, UNRWA is a vehicle for Hamas reassertion of control and political influence in Gaza long term. So again, if you keep UNRWA in Gaza, you're going to keep Hamas in business. All these red lines are interrelated in my view. Now, the Israelis have made it their state of policy to isolate UNRWA, not work with UNRWA, try to cut out UNRWA. There are elements in Kogat, the uh, IDF branch that is involved in uh, dealing with uh, the Palestinian areas, including Gaza and thinking about distribution of aid and managing it and trying to understand how aid gets in. Um, historically, that branch of the IDF has been the defender of UNRWA because nobody wanted to deal with the alternative to UNRWA. Nobody wanted to actually do the work of like, well, how else are we going to do this? They're there. They have infrastructure. Let them do the job. That has stopped. At a leadership level in Kogat, no one is defending UNRWA anymore. They understand that that, that game is over after October 7th and the intelligence that's come out. And so if the Israelis hold firm to blocking UNRWA from playing a major role in Gaza, they can operationally just stop it from happening. You know, a lot of people are going to crow about it. The international community will crow. The UN will have a general assembly resolution about it. But in the absence of UNRWA being allowed to do things, the United States and other partners will be able to go fund alternatives 
to UNRWA. And if there is a plan in place, which I'm hoping to get out there in, in public domain soon, we'll be able to push for Congress to fund that alternative and to permanently block any U.S. assistance, not just directly, but indirectly uh, to UNRWA going forward. Okay. We talked about a lot of these things. We went through the five conditions here. Uh, we talked about the, the ceasefire uh, negotiations uh, at hand. We can go into that more. We talked about Ramadan and what it means right now, the hostage pressures that continue in Israel. You see the protests and the families that continue to plead with the government uh, to uh, to stop uh, operations, uh, to to free hostages. You see some families, by the way, that have come from the other direction and asked the the uh, government not to halt operations, in fact, to escalate uh, to try to get uh, hostages home. And you also have a growing number of IDF fallen and their families and their views. Uh, when you think about how many hostages remain versus how many bereaved IDF families have uh, loved ones who have made the ultimate sacrifice after October 7th, and they want to see that sacrifice not be in vain, there's a lot of competing pressures uh, inside Israeli society for us to reflect on and, and how that all fits together. We talked about Rafa versus Northern uh, Stabilization, and we talked about Sinwar himself uh, and uh, and the need to find him and kill him at some point. Uh, wherever he is hiding. So a lot that we haven't covered, I'm sure, on Iran, on the Houthis, on Saudi Arabia normalization. And let's see where we go with questions, but back to you. Thank you. I think we all have to take a deep breath and try to assimilate some of the things that you've said to us, Rich. Um, you seem to be taking the position that this, at the moment, at least, the differences between the United States and Israel are more tactical than strategic which first of all raises the question as to why Israel should take um, tactical or strategic advice from the people who brought you Afghanistan. But what you're really looking at um, possibly is that Israel didn't move fast enough. Is it possible that Israel should have moved into Rafah faster, shoved the civilians aside and not allowed some of this political maneuvering to happen? Was that ever a viable military strategy? And is it a viable political strategy? Uh, well, let me let me just say, I, I, I think there is a strategic disconnect, not just a tactical disconnect. There's clearly a strategic disconnect when you look at the administration vying for a two-state solution, for recognition of a Palestinian state after October 7th, for uh, trying to keep unrefunded by asking our allies to increase, to, to resume their funding, which you started seeing happening. And I understand as the State Department's asking them to do that, to, to backfill the United States. Uh, the involvement of the Qataris, the involvement of the Palestinian Authority potentially in the day after. These are all strategic contradictions to where the Israelis are at. Um, so I don't want to downplay the, the strategic uh, disconnect and up and contradiction that, that, that we are seeing unfold. Um, the, the, the only piece of that is whether or not the United States can do anything to actually enforce their view, to impose their views, or whether they understand the domestic politics, not their base politics that they appear to be most concerned about at the moment and managing, but the broader domestic politics of the United States where independent voters support Israel. Um, many Democrats support Israel um, on the centrist side of the Democratic Party. And so this idea that America has given up on Israel, the president's policies reflect the will of the American people is not true. It's just not true. The numbers aren't there. It, he reflects the will of, of of tens of thousands of people in Dearborn, Michigan. Um, he doesn't reflect the will of many people who live in the Detroit suburbs. Um, so he clearly is out of step with one of the United States senators from from Pennsylvania, a major battleground state. So um, so no, I I don't I don't think that's entirely correct. Um, but on Rafa itself, I, I'm not yet convinced that. Israel shouldn't take into consideration some of the points being raised for their own strategic victory, notwithstanding the idea that those points may still be raised by the White House to block Israel from achieving that strategic victory. That's where I'm not sold yet on, on, on that happening, but it's clear the administration has a, had a roadmap in place as of last month, get a ceasefire in Gaza, try to keep it, try to force Israel into low-level operations as soon as possible before Rafa starts. 
spread that to a ceasefire deal in Lebanon, which is going to be terrible for Israel and good for Hezbollah, allow the Saudis to come forward and do their deal, get Israel to commit to something on a two-state solution to get the Saudis there under the terms the Biden administration wants. And suddenly by summer, he's turned the chaos of the world into world peace uh, and quiet and pulls a rabbit out of his hat in, in a tough re-election. That's what I actually think is the plan in the White House, or at least was at least a month ago from multiple multiple conversations and sources. Okay, so you- Did they wait too long for Rafa to your, to your, to your question? I personally uh, don't believe that they um, need to be acting on, it is bad military operations planning to operate on an arbitrary political timetable. If they have not taken Khan Yunus completely, if they have instability in Northern and Central Gaza, um, they need to focus on that before expanding their military operations and stretching themselves to a place where Hamas could take advantage of other areas. And so while, you know, it would be nice if the Biden administration wasn't doing what they're doing to Israel publicly and putting so much pressure on Israel not to go into Rafa, that would be a much better reality for Israel's security. Um, but it is not to say that Israel made a mistake in not going forward sooner to preempt this pressure. It's go. I mean, we're talking about not six months since October 7th, and the IDF has routed you know, 18 or 19 of 24 battalions for remaining in, in, in Rafa and, you know, a couple others spread out here, still found Yunus to fall. Uh, that's unbelievable. You think about, and to do so, to, to do all that with a relative low number of civilian casualties, a controversial statement, apparently in the mainstream media, uh, but I'll make it anyway. Not here. Uh, not here. Yeah, not here. here. Uh, you know, probably historic in, in modern warfare, um, I, I think is an incredible accomplishment. The fact that the egg timer on Jews being allowed to defend themselves is just five months for many in the White House is the tragedy of the situation. So you say um, the president probably does not reflect the will of the American people on this subject, the broad will of the American people. Uh, certainly not Republicans, probably not independents, and even some Democrats. So what are they looking for? Here I'm going to go to your other area of expertise, Rich, and that is Iran. All the things that the Biden administration is pursuing, which is the two-state solution that will never happen, the rescue of Hamas by Qatar, Qatar being uh, alternately uh, Iran's face to the civilized world and its ATM machine. Put the money in Qatar, it comes out in Tehran. Is the Biden administration doing all of this? Oh, and, and by the way, you mentioned the Houthis who have killed people. They have killed our allies. They have shot at us. And Iranian militias in Iraq who have killed American service personnel. We have done nothing as regards retaliation. Is the Biden administration looking to Iran rather than to the American people for what it should be doing? Is this appeasement for Iran? Uh, there is a strong appeasement policy. Um, and I think they they spun very early on separating Iran from <clears throat> October 7th. That was purposeful. Leaking as much information as they could, intelligence assessments, Iran didn't know about this, Iran's not a part of this, Iran didn't. We, we still ultimately hold Iran accountable because they're the chief sponsor of Hamas militarily and weapons and training, but, but, but. All you're reading the New York Times and Wall Street Journal of actual IRGC people on the record and Hezbollah people on the record saying that Hamas was trained and a lot of this planning did originate in Iran. That's not true. There's no, no, no connection there. Uh, and in fact, just um, 10 days after October 7th, the president was on his way on a flight to Israel, historic visit, important visit. Um, and while he was on the flight, he allowed the UN missile embargo on Iran to expire under the old nuclear deal, under the Security Council resolution. Put a snap back UN sanctions with our allies. It had a lot of political support after October 7th to do that. Didn't do it. Let it expire. Now they're all shocked that apparently Iran's preparing or has already started sending ballistic missiles to Russia since the missile embargo expired. Uh, everybody's surprised by that. No, but no one here is surprised. Um, November comes along. 
And the president has his first opportunity to reverse what had been a summer long effort to pump money into Iran as part of a nuclear arrangement, as they call it, arrangement, euphemism to avoid saying deal or agreement, uh, which has legal implications for the White House to submit a deal to the Congress for review. And there was some reported arrangement where we'll start opening up spigots of cash, $10 billion out of Iraq, moved into accounts in Oman, the $6 billion of the hostage deal moved from South Korea into Qatar. Oil can flow unlimited numbers from Iran to China. We won't do anything about it. And we'll look for other levers as well to pull as, as the months go by, so long as Iran simply doesn't force the United States to act, because apparently mass terrorism around the region doesn't force us to act proliferation of missiles doesn't force us to act. Enriching uranium at high level, 60% purity, which is a stone's throw from weapons grade, installing more centrifuges, and building an underground, potentially militarily impenetrable facility near Natanz right now, none of that compels us to act, nor does Iran support for Russia against Ukraine, its ongoing assassination plots to kill American officials, uh, its attempts to kidnap Americans off U.S. soil, its partnership with Hezbollah to try to send people to the southern border, as we've seen in the news recently, um, or its crackdown on women and the way it treats its own women and a national uprising. None of that compels us to act. But if Iran were to enrich uranium at 90 percent, the weapons grade level, that apparently would be the new red line. That's the red line. Maybe. I don't think that's a red line actually militarily for the United States at this point or for our allies, but that's what the deal was. Don't go to 90%. You're going to put us in a really bad position where we might have to do something, and we'll keep the cash flowing if you just stay below that level. October 7th didn't change the deal. The president renewed a sanctions waiver in November to keep the cash flowing, and he just renewed the waiver again about a week ago to keep the cash flowing. Uh, these are Iraqi payments for electricity. They get moved to Iranian bank accounts in Oman, and then the Iranians can use it to pay debts and support its budget. Uh, and we don't know the current status of the $6 billion. Early on, there was a Senate move to try to freeze that money. It was in everybody's mind because the hostage deal had just happened. So there's $6 billion in the news. Nobody knew about the $10 billion from Iraq. So the administration got ahead of legislation, didn't want to be tied by law. And they said, oh, we're going to freeze the money. We're going to freeze the money. Is it frozen today? Five months later, six months later, we don't actually know. Iran's using the $10 billion. Maybe they don't need the $6 billion yet. It's just there in reserve. So what is happening here? So you'll see the media news narrative, which is bolstered by the White House narrative, where they don't want the Gaza war to escalate into a regional war. So when Hezbollah is raining down missiles on northern Israel and sending drones, and when militias in Iraq and Syria are attacking U.S. forces or attacking Israel, and when the Houthis are launching missiles and drones into the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, or at Eilat, that's not Iran having its own regional war that has been ongoing for months and is escalating at Iran's behest. That's a response to Israel escalating in Gaza. And you see that in headlines. You see that. That's the, narrative. That's the, that's the accepted narrative for a lot of the American left. Uh, and for the mainstream media and for the White House. And so their solution to this is buy the quiet, rent the quiet. And if we can find Tehran's price, we know they're behind all of these different fires that they've set. Is there something that we can give them, that we can offer them in addition to the 10 billion that will get them to restrain the Houthis, that will make sure that we get a ceasefire with Hezbollah uh, after there's a ceasefire in Gaza, uh, et cetera. Now, the U.S. military did finally respond in Iraq, and it did so pretty heftily. Uh, I don't, you know, I from all of my analysis of what I've heard, we did start targeting high-level officials within the Iraqi militias. We never targeted IRGC. We never targeted an Iranian. Big mistake, which is why the Houthis continue to attack. Um, but we did cause some serious damage to the Iraqi militias. We've never decided to take that same step towards the Houthis. We're hitting idiotic targets, away from civilian population centers, which means we're not hitting their capabilities, which we know are embedded near or in civilian population centers. We're not targeting Houthi leadership. We're targeting some underground bunkers where we say some stuff is stored, maybe. And when our 
which is clearly very proactive intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, we say ISR assets are picking up potential launches of missiles and drones, we have standing guidance to the US Navy to take out those, those threats. Um, but that is what I think is going on here. It's an entire appeasement posture. We are at the behest of Iranian extortion requests. And if I'm the Iranians, this is great. What, what do I? I mean, unless they get afraid at some point that this chaos is going to tip the election or contribute to a feeling of angst, and they fear uh, Donald Trump more than they fear Joe Biden as president, then maybe they have an interest in cutting a deal at some point and helping create quiet to help to help the president. That's a calculus they have. In my view, I think they like the status quo. They're pushing around the United States. They're distracting the United States. They're advancing their nuclear program quite a bit. The president is struggling in all these different areas. The U.S. is now showing that it has a weakness and lack of deterrence and won't respond to threats. Can't guarantee maritime safety in a major waterway. The Chinese are taking note of that as well in their own context for the Indo-Pacific. We're stressed now in multiple theaters trying to support Ukraine, continuing to support Israel, threats from China growing. So I don't think it's just Iran in here. I think Iran's coordinating with Russia and China, and we should also have that in the back of our mind about how the broader geopolitical dynamic of the United States is, is impacted here. Uh, but clearly the U.S. is desperate to find Iran's price to buy the quiet, rent the quiet. So... Looking still at Iran and looking at Hezbollah, it seemed that at the beginning of, of Israel's entry into Gaza, large scale entry into Gaza, that Hamas had actually expected help from Hezbollah and increased help from the West Bank. And they were planning on more rockets. Hezbollah has been shooting. Israelis were displaced. I think the number right now is about 60,000 Israelis can't return to their homes in the north. But it wasn't the all out assault that perhaps Hamas was hoping to have, and there wasn't really much of a, anything from the West Bank, just low level stuff. Is it possible that Hezbollah and, and its patron Iran were deterred by early Israeli successes in Gaza? You saw Israel go in full steam. They did a heck of a job eliminating tunnels, going through the networks, routing people, taking out battalions. Um, is it possible that Iran said, wait a minute, Hezbollah is too important to lose? and therefore they restrain it and keep it at a certain low level, enough to upset the Israelis, enough to do damage in Israel, but not enough to create the kind of retaliation they fear. Uh, yes, I, I, I mostly agree with that. Um, I think the, remember Hezbollah is created as one of the major guardians for the Islamic Republic. They're there to protect Iran and its interests primarily, uh, more so than you would even say of Hamas, which comes out of a mix of uh, Muslim Brotherhood ideology, Palestinian uh, politics, and then Iranian sponsorship and support over many years. Um, and so in that context, if you're worried about an Israeli strike in Iran on the nuclear program at some point, uh, or a U.S. strike at some point, you want to maintain as robust a capability to threaten and deter Israel as you can on its northern border. And when we talk about rockets going into Kiryat Shmona uh, or Rosha Nikra, or even a, a missile that, that reaches um, uh, all the way to Tzfat, this is nothing in the arsenal of Hezbollah. We're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of missiles that can go much farther into Israel in droves, precision guided, many of them, uh, capable of causing mass destruction to civilian population centers and critical infrastructure. And just a major war that Israel um, may or may not be truly ready for, even though they're going to have to fight it at some point. And certainly, I don't think anybody on this call is truly ready for what that war looks like. Um, in that construct, Nasrallah is not going to suffer a massive setback in that capability unless it is the moment that he needs to use that capability, either in self-defense, if the Israelis have decided it's their moment to attack and he has no choice, or a moment of Iran's choosing for its strategic goals. Based on conversations, it does sound like um, Hamas jumped the gun 
on October 7th. That's what they, that's what people claim. It, to me, the timing of it, Simchat Torah, everybody's drunk, everybody's home on vacation, you know, the whole construct of doing something on that day is clearly calculated. So the idea that Hezbollah thought, oh, it was going to be October 9th, right now, October 7th, that's not possible. That's not possible. So the idea that they were plotting something for the future and something was going to happen at some point, but that nobody told Hezbollah it was going to be, or nobody told Nasrallah it was going to be on October 7th. I, if that's what every intelligence person in the West and Israel is going to, is going to tell you, then, you know, I'll take that. Um, I don't, I, I can't dispute it. I don't see the intelligence myself at this time, but it, it, it seems hard for me to believe. But if you take that assumption that in some ways, Nasrallah wasn't ready on October 7th to go, and therefore his forces weren't positioned in a way where they had defensive positions taken, they would guarded their capabilities, they were very vulnerable. And the President of the United States threatens uh, in some way, sends some signals and, and you know, send the second carrier strike group towards the region with a message to Nasrallah. Whether you believe in that moment he would have used that force or not, there are a lot of people who believe that that did force Nasrallah not to join the fight in that moment. Now, let's say he did know it was coming and he was plotting to do something escalatory, but still he somehow was deterred by the U.S. threat potential and the overwhelming threat potential of, of, of Israel and what you say, what they were pledging to do in, in Gaza. Over time, we know that the deterrence effect of the American deployment of a carrier strike group diminished because we didn't do anything. We just sat there um, and we didn't do anything to Iran after being hit multiple times. So at some point Nasrallah said, oh, this, this is actually just a paper tiger. We're not, this is, a, this is a pageant. This is just a parade of military vehicles. This isn't actually here to deter us. Um, so whatever was valuable in the first week started showing diminishing value at deterrence. And at that point it became Israeli deterrence to the extent that was possible by showing Hezbollah what it would do to Lebanon of what it was doing in Gaza. But even then, I think it is overconfidence and, and quite the hubris of the moment to self-delude ourselves that in any way Nasrallah is deterred today. Uh, I don't believe he is. I think he has reached a status quo where he sees Israel constrained by the United States, reports of Biden uh, arguing and, and threatening Israel early on not to have a preemptive strike on Hezbollah in the days after October 7th, when they were weakest, and potentially still holding back on that. The potential that Israel could be stretched in its military capabilities with U.S. threatening military assistance, can it really take on that war right now? And at the same time, Israel not having responded in a more escalatory way, showing that it is in some ways either fearful of an escalation or incapable of escalating, invites sustained very minor escalation curve from from uh, from Nasrallah to keep the status quo, keep all the civilian population evacuated, and mounting political pressure on Israel to do something to return the population to the north. So if you're unwilling or unable to have an operation to degrade Hezbollah, and you're under pressure to return your population to the north, and there's mounting U.S. pressure to de-escalate across the board, this is a very, very dangerous moment where Nasrallah sees a moment of opportunity to squeeze the Israelis into a bad ceasefire deal where Lebanon and Hezbollah will gain and Israel will ultimately lose. You may see a, de see a deal emerge this year. I guarantee you it will not defang Hezbollah. It will not reduce the threat. It will be lipstick on a pig. Uh, and uh, I would not believe any Israeli spin or American spin of what that deal does unless there is verifiable dismantlement of Hezbollah capabilities throughout southern Lebanon, which is just not going to happen without military action. So we're coming to the end of our program, Rich. Um, I'm tempted to ask you, since you mentioned that um, people were drunk on Simpas Torah, which is, which is a common tradition, and Saturday night is Purim, and we're going to do it again. Uh, but I'm going to skip that question. Most of what you've said here is... How do I say this? Pessimistic. It's not a positive outlook for the future, neither for U.S.-Israel relations, U.S. 
Iranian relations, Israel in the region. I, and we didn't even talk about the Abraham Accords. I think, yeah. you know, one might have hoped that the U.S. would look to the Abraham Accords countries rather than Qatar as the interlocutor for things in Gaza. But it didn't because it doesn't care for those either. So um, I have a tradition. I don't like to go out of these programs on a negative note. And you've given us lots of negative notes. Give us a positive. Do you have an optimistic line um, for where all this could end up, where it might end up, and where we can hope it ends up? Uh, I do. Uh, and that is because I think the president's policies on many of the issues we talked about are disconnected from the American people and from Congress. Uh, and and I believe it's just fundamentally disconnected from the reality of Israel in Israel post October 7th. And so while politically it's convenient for the left now to use Netanyahu as their punching bag, and to say they don't oppose Israel, they just oppose Netanyahu. We know that's not true because the same voices opposed Israel when Naftali Bennett was prime minister. And they had a coalition that included an Arab party. So I don't buy any of that. But the the, the bottom line is that even if Benny Gantz was prime minister right now, he would have to execute the same policies. Because 83% of Israeli support going into Rafa, is a similar percentage opposes the Palestinian state right now. Um, the, the, there's a fundamental disconnect of the 1990s still being in charge of our foreign policy in the Middle East in this White House and October 7th, 2023, being the reality of the rest of the world and certainly in Israel. So the fact that there is unity inside Israel politically on the key parameters that I outlined and support for those parameters in the U.S. Congress, I think on a bipartisan basis, means that if everyone redoubles their efforts to push in that direction to support Israel completing these strategic objectives of the war in every way that the IDF deems is the responsible course and the timeline for that, and to push Congress to condition our support for what comes next on the key parameters of what can't come next, I think we can end up in a good place. It just means making sure we beat back what the administration is doing that is wrong and supporting Congress and pushing in a direction that is right. Rich Goldberg, I'm surprised you came up with an optimistic end of the conversation, but I really appreciate it. On behalf of all of our listeners today and on behalf of the Jewish Policy Center, I want to thank you for some serious enlightenment and a lot of things to think about over the weekend. Thank you very much, and I hope you'll come back again. Absolutely, and happy Purim to those who celebrate. Happy poor.